Danny, we did it. We got the goat of ad tech on taking inventory. Eric Sufert, the man who coined everything is an ad network. Just spent an hour with us. I learned a ton. Been following him for years on Twitter. Been reading Quantmar, mobile dev memo. I'm part of his Slack group. To finally uh, to meet him face to face virtually was uh, was a treat. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I kind of felt like a little pathetic as a fanboy when I told him I'm sorry for always liking his tweets or X's, whatever they're called. I agree, James. That's uh, that was a little embarrassing, but Eric needs no real introduction. Yet we're still gonna give a little bit of one. Hopefully, everyone really enjoys it. Eric Sufert is a media strategist, quantitative marketer, and author who has spent his career working for transformative consumer tech and media companies. Eric founded Agamemnon, a startup that built a mobile marketing analytics platform, which was acquired in 2017. Following that acquisition, Eric launched Heracles Capital, an early stage venture capital fund focused on the mobile ecosystem. Eric also runs Mobile Dev Memo, a mobile advertising and freemium monetization trade blog, and Quantmar, a knowledge-based sharing platform for quantitative marketers. Eric's been featured and quoted in The Information, Business Insider, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and many, many more. So really fortunate to have Eric joining us today. Uh, Eric, excited to have you here. Cheers, Daniel, James. Nice to be with you today. Appreciate it, man. So I think you know most people who followed your work know that you're the one that coined the phrase, everything is an ad network. We thought that'd be a good place to start, really just kind of to kind of learn more about you know, where that originated and at what point you realized that that this was the case. I think I think now everyone recognizes that you were right, but we kind of just love to know the, the origin story of that, of that famous phrase. Yeah, that's a good place to start. So there are kind of two lenses through which that idea can be viewed, right? So everything is an ad network and then just, you know, ad networks are really attractive businesses, right? Or, or and I think that that latter observation, I think is, is all, all credit is owed to a Twitter account called Modest Proposal. They, I think were the, 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 the genesis of that idea belongs, belongs to them. It's like an anonymous FinTwit account. And, and that observation was just, if you have a large audience, it's very attractive to introduce ads to that audience, no matter what the product is, right? Because that's just free money, right? And that's a, a very astute observation. Uh, all credit for that observation goes to uh, a modest proposal. My take on it is a little bit different. It's a little bit more specific, right? So everything in ad, as everything is an ad network relates to the evolution of the digital advertising space with respect to privacy. And the obstruction of the formerly free flow of data between parties that enabled platforms like Facebook, platforms like YouTube, platforms like TikTok to build these kind of all-encompassing internet-wide behavioral profiles of users and then serve ads to them in a walled garden setting, right? Like that is not possible as a result of Apple's privacy policy, app tracking transparency, it's not possible as a result of the DMA or, or soon to be not possible as a result of the DMA. And, and increasingly, it's not even really going to be possible with first party data. Um, so the idea there being that without consent, right? So the idea behind everything is an ad network is that this increasingly restrictive privacy environment means that the only data available for targeting ads is really like intent, intent-based data, right? I go onto a platform and I search for something and, and a little bit of like first-party data that's behavioral. But again, in the EU, that's even sort of under threat, right? So if I have this big scaled audience, right, but I'm competing with a walled garden ad platform that can collect conversion artifacts from across the web and aggregate those at the user level and target ads against them, I stand no chance in competing with that walled garden, right? There's just nothing that I can really bring to bear for the advertiser that will win their dollars above and beyond, or will win their, do will win their advertising dollars away from that platform. It's just impossible to compete. Now, when they can't do that, when they can't aggregate data from all over the web to bring to bear for that advertising for that advertiser for targeting purposes, then we're kind of, then, then maybe I have an advantage, right? Because I do have my first party data. I don't have as much 
first party data as they had third party data previously, but now they don't have any third party data and their first party data is not very valuable for advertising purposes, right? Whereas mine is because it's tied to commercial intent. So if I have, it's, it's, the, it's kind of, you could rephrase it as the old adage, like in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Well, in the land of the blind, meaning in the land where no one has access to this third-party data, then my first-party data, even though it's much more limited than what their third-party data was, is more valuable than their first-party data. And I can compete with their advertising platform in a, in a context-specific space, right? In a context-specific way with, with some sort of contextual relevancy, right? So think about it this way. If I'm Ulta Beauty, right? Ulta Beauty has an, an ad network. They've got a retail media network. They take their audience data and they allow it to be targeted on DSPs, right? They also have an advertising uh, product on their website um, and in their app, right? Well, if I'm Ulta Beauty and you want to go and target beauty product purchasers, are you going to go to me where I have an audience of some tens of millions of beauty product purchasers that you could freely target? Or are you going to go to Facebook where they have no such audience because they can't collect that from third parties anymore? Right. Well, I don't know. You might come to me because I have that I have ownership of that audience and, and, and it's first party to me. And those are very relevant for your advertising needs. Uh, whereas prior uh, to ATT and prior to this sort of sea change in privacy, you would have gone to Facebook because Facebook was collecting that data from every sort of like beauty specific website and app that existed on the Internet. Right. So that's the idea of time. Everything is an ad network because every, everything now is capable of becoming an ad network, whereas before there would have been no possibility to compete with the big scaled wall gardens. Well, now there is. And that's when you see Lowe's, Dollar Tree, sorry, Dollar General, Ulta Beauty, Walmart, you know, Amazon's uh, ad platform continues to grow at a rapid clip, 22 percent this last quarter on a year over year basis. So all of these retail media networks are, are emerging to take advantage of that new operating reality. And, and in that new reality, right, we're seeing TikTok, Facebook's Instagram, try to get into the commerce space, Instagram shops, TikTok yeah. shopping, to try to get more of that data. We've seen this trend for platforms to really ask their partners to integrate the conversion API, to get data sent directly to them, not relying on a pixel. And so do you mm -hmm. think, like, let's start with the conversion API. Is that kind of a, you know, an effort in futility where that is just going to go the same way as the pixel or is that have some longevity to it? And then you know, longer term, moving towards a, a commerce on platform experience, do you think that is truly defensible or is that just another kind of plug into kind of the gaps that they're, that are being created? Yeah, let me, let me start, let me start with the sort of on platform commerce experience question first, right? So yeah, I think FB shops is like the canonical example of that, right? And that's, and that's the example that I pointed to when I first wrote the, my original piece called everything's an ad network. So what, and let me just explain what they're doing to, for people that aren't familiar, right? So FB shops emerged during COVID, right? When it became, you know, an important initiative for, for Meta to capture just this sort of e-commerce e activity, just, just given the, the, the surge in, in, in e-commerce sort of like commercial activity generally, right? Because of COVID, because of the lockdowns. And so, you know, mobilize the team, they built this out. And the whole idea is that a retailer can host their storefront on Facebook or on Instagram, right? So you can host your storefront in those apps and you can facilitate the checkout right then and there, right? So someone's on Facebook, someone's on Instagram, they see something interesting, they can click through to the, to the store, the native storefront in the app, they can buy that thing and they never have to leave that app, right? Now, when they do that, first of all, that's just a, a much... Uh, uh, sort of like much more convenient, faster, much, you know, much less friction approach to selling stuff. So I think that's why it was attractive during COVID because, hey, we want to maximize this opportunity, this e-commerce opportunity. But, you know, a nice benefit of that is that, well, if, if Facebook or Meta is either on Facebook or on Instagram, they're facilitating that transaction, then they get to keep all of the data emitted from that transaction process as in a, in a first party setting like that they have first party privileges to that right so in essence what would have happened prior to fb shops is it would have been an ad that you click on you go to some web-based storefront or maybe even an app you buy something that uh, property owner that advertised to you they want to send the artifact of that conversion back to meta because that's going to sort of be ingested into their into their sort of conversion model and and it'll tell meta hey this was a good user go find me more users like that and that enables the flywheel right like the the targeting optimization flywheel well you know post att that's that's broken that sort of like that that transfer process is broken and so what facebook wants to do is it wants to wrap its arms around that same data 
to the extent that it can with first party privileges, right? So that's enabled those first party privileges are unlocked when they actually facilitate the transaction. Now what they can do is they can say, Hey, retailer, the reason you should host your uh, shop in FB shops is that you can buy ads against it. And when the conversions happen, we'll know that those ads happened as a result of this ad click. And we can optimize your ad campaign in the same way that we could before, right? It, we can, we can sort of like resume that feedback loop, whereas it's totally broken if you try to enable it off, off platform, off site, right? Now, What's interesting is that, you know, Facebook announced, a, I don't know, I think a year ago, or maybe six months ago, that they were sort of ending the Instagram shopping experience. And a lot of people took that as like some sort of capitulation, took that announcement as some sort of capitulation that they were, they were abandoning this effort. They were abandoning, you know, the, the shopping experience on platform. And actually, that's not true. What they were doing was what they had, had, what they had offered prior was, was like sort of a shopping tab where you could just discover stuff. So they brought to bear their sort of like recommendation technology to, to, to surface items that you might like to buy, right? And, and, and you know, surface those to you and then you'd click them and, and maybe you'd go to the, the shop or maybe you'd go, or you'd go to their shop, right? And, and so essentially it was like a free ad. They were just creating this discovery mechanism for like random items that they've determined that, you know, are relevant for you and you'd click through. Well, what they did in getting rid of that was just force all those retailers to buy ads instead. Right. So they're actually doubling down on that initiative. They were not abandoning it. They just got rid of the tab. They didn't get rid of FB shops and Instagram shops. Now what they've done is they've said, okay, well, if you want to have an FB shop, you've got to offer Facebook checkout. So you've got to allow us to facilitate tr the transaction. So they essentially just made all of this uh, uh, supporting infrastructure for their ads business rather than making it like just a, like a, like a free discovery mechanic for the retailers. Right. So they've doubled down on that initiative. I think the fact that they've doubled down on it probably shows that it has uh, legs that they feel like it it's it's a, it's a viable pathway to to regaining some of that signal that they lost. And I think the fact that you know you see every social platform trying to replicate it too is is another sort of signal in support of that idea. Yeah. So I, in my sense is like that that is and I wrote a piece about this a while back called you know the the like an unintended consequence of ATT content fortresses right. So this kind of goes into this content fortress. My, my idea with the content fortress is that you take a big you t you take a large scale consumer audience. And you pair that with sort of like first party content. And then you pair that with an ad platform. It creates this sort of like self-contained ads ecosystem that's not dependent on, you know, off, off platform property sending you data back. And that's what basically every big scaled consumer tech company is trying to achieve now. They're trying to like wrap their arms around all three of those components so that they can sort of like have a, it's almost like a, like a nuclear fusion, like self-sustaining perpetual commerce machine, right? Because they're not dependent on other parties sending them new data. The data just sort of gets recycled around within their own, within their own walls, right? It's a content fortress. Yeah. It's kind of ironic because I remember when I like first got into sort of social network, like working at the you know platforms, it was like 2009 or 10 and, and a big theme was like content community and commerce. It was yeah. like a cheesy line that everyone was saying. And now you look at like what you're describing as the content fortress. It's basically owning all three of those and just moving people like through that cycle. It, 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 if that does get to that point, like, is there a concern that regulators are going to start requiring the shoppers on Instagram shops to opt in to that commerce tracking as well? Like, is that a concern that that will no longer be kind of that is there concern that it will require opt-in on what is now thought of as first party data well yeah i so i'm just i just finished a piece going live tomorrow about you know about that exact situation happening in europe right so if, if you know for the people that aren't really following this super closely like the, the norwegian dpa which is like the the privacy regulator issued a temporary ban to, to Meta for, for like all forms of behavioral advertising using third party data and first party data, right? So, so, so meaning that, you know, they're, they're ultimately so get, un, under the legal basis that they're currently using to, to process that data, right? So, and, and Meta sort of like in response to that, but, but ultimately like in response to some commentary that was made by the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, in July, last week said, we are shifting our the legal basis under the GDPR under which we process user data for behavioral advertising to consent, right? So they, they used to be contractual necessity, which basically means, hey, if you agree to the terms of service, then you 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 agree that we can collect this data 
from you for to use in personal behavioral advertising. Then they the the sort of the Irish DPC there's kind of like a long history here, but the Irish DPC said, said, okay, well that that's actually a violation of GDPR. You can't package those two things together. So then they shifted to this like legitimate interest basis. This the, the CJEU basically said, well, no, we we question the validity of that. The Norwegian DPA took those took that commentary as like air cover to issue this ban. And now Meta just said, okay, you know what? We're shifting to consent. So we're, users will have to like affirmatively consent to having their data collected for this purpose. And if they say no, then we can't do that, right? So yes, that is a risk. Now, I think the risk, well, it's, it's not even a risk, it's a reality. I think the risk of that happening in the US is much less acute, but hey, who knows? I mean, anything can happen. And you've, you've written pieces now on kind of the Apple's most recent kind of updates to its privacy terms of service, the privacy manifesto, a lot of that. And as, as we look at kind of the, the regulation from governments, so the Norwegian government, the Irish government, the you know, GDPR regulation, CCPA in California, the US federal government, and then more platform regulation. So what Apple's doing, what Google's doing, what some of the larger, those two in particular, H- how does that all start to coalesce, do you think? I mean, if it is, is Facebook and other platforms going to have to start carving out regional and country specific types of platforms with different use cases? Are they just going to go with kind of the the you know bare necessity and say okay if if you know Norway is the most stringent we're just going to apply that across the world like how how does a company like that start to make sense of all of these third parties kind of restricting what it can and cannot do in different markets? Well, I mean they already have to they already have to do that they already have to take you know regional considerations mm-hmm. into account. The question to me though is like is is this doesn't feel like a Norway issue this feels like an opening salvo to ban behavioral advertising that will be followed by a number of other, you know, European DPAs, right? I think the door was opened by the CJEU to, 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 you know, to, to sort of like allow for this reality. And I think, you know, the most aggressive DPAs are going to take them up on that. Right. So I think like from the perspective of a big platform, I mean, you, you, they've already had to sort of deal with just regional differences in policy, you know, the, with, with Apple, I mean, app, so, you know, the, the sort of like confounding, issue with Apple is that it's not a government. I mean, it's very large and, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, annual revenue is larger than a lot of, you know, GDPs, but it's, it's nonetheless, when it writes platform policy, that's not law. Right. And Apple is very, very careful to not, how should I say this, to, to not be very clear about how they are going to enforce the law because they want to give themselves ultimate latitude to do that on a case by case basis. And so that has been the frustrating aspect of, of Apple's privacy policy changes. They're sort of meant to be as nebulous as possible, which A, just kind of forces people to take the most stringent interpretation just out of safety, but B, gives them total flexibility to enforce selectively, right? Now with Apple, you know, the, 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 the issue now is like, well, ATT was kind of seen as extraordinarily disruptive. And it was, but the fact of the matter is that ATT is less restrictive than a lot of the ways that the GDPR is being interpreted by in Europe now, right? So for instance, and not, and not, not even just the GDPR, but the e-privacy directive, the whole privacy apparatus in Europe, right? So like there was recently a case, uh, for example, where the sort of like domestic privacy regulator in France, the Canil, they find a company called Voodoo Games, which is just a hyper casual games developer for accessing the IDFV to do, you know, to, to, to provide behavioral advertising. The idea of V is a, a, a dev- device identifier that is specifically made available to developers by Apple when they opt out of ATT so that they have some sort of identifier to use, right? And it's only consistent across that developer's apps, but not with any other developer. So it's only really useful for that developer. Well, the Canil said, look, that's fine. That, that is, you know, that, that complies with Apple's policy, but it doesn't comply with the e-privacy directive as we've written it into law in France. And so none, you know, nonetheless, you're complying with Apple's policy, but you're not complying with the e-privacy directive as it was uh, codified into law in France. And so we're finding you, right? So the reality is like where the EU is taking this is, is much more extreme than, than where Apple took it. And, and from your point of view, and I know this is like, you know, crystal ball kind of thing, but you know, we have some friends that are over at Apple that have a lot of ads ex- ads experience, and and obviously they've they've sort of ramped up obviously ads products than the App Store. Do you think that this is all like a precursor to them kind of turning on sort of that monetization scheme in kind of in a larger way, or do you think this really is more around like sort of the just like logical kind of belief in privacy 
and sort of like ending sort of the surveillance state of what Meta, you know, is kind of accused of doing. Like, and, and I guess, and then, and then second part of the question is like, would you be really bullish on an Apple ads, you know, platform that was at scale without a lot of the commerce components or is Apple pay and all of that enough? So, I mean, to the first question, like, is, is this, is this just a, a, an attempt to clear a lane for them to launch a, an incredibly lucrative a- advertising, like, you know, expanded advertising platform? Of course it is. That, <laughs> there's no ideology or, or there is only ideology when it aligns with the commercial objective. Apple is the richest company in human history. They don't, they didn't get there uh, through like just a, a benevolent scheme. Everything they do has uh, a, the singular purpose of enriching their shareholders. And you know what? That's neither good nor bad. It just is. If you're a capitalist, as I am, I can respect that. The, the, and and I, can even re, I can even respect the narrative that they've constructed around this, right? Because that's all in pursuit of serving the shareholders. And that's, that's their singular purpose on this planet. There is no ideology that that can that can supersede that. Now there could be ideology that coincides with that. There could be ideolo- ideology that you know in that moment in time or for some specific purpose aligns with that. But there can be no ideology that supersedes that commercial objective. So fair game, fair game to them. They did it. Now the the other question is, uh, and so of, so my answer is yes, of course, of course, all of that was done to clear a path for them to expand their advertising product. Now the question is, am I very bullish about their advertising product? Yes, I am. The question is, what shape does it take, right? So like what Apple could do is, and, you know, if you look at the jobs page, and this has been reported on, this isn't, yeah. you know, my unique observation, but if you look at their jobs page, their careers subsite, they're hiring a lot of people for their ads product. They're hiring people to build a DSP and an SSP. So yeah, they're probably building an end-to-end network. Now, where will that network live? Now, keep in mind that currently a- Apple has sort of like two ads products. They have Apple search ads, which is, you know, their app install product that exists in the app store and in news and in stocks, those apps. And then they have a separate ad product where you can just buy, you know, display ads across those apps as well. So wh- how could they expand that? Well, they could expand that into being an end-to-end ad network where they're actually serving placements in third-party apps, right? So right now they only serve placements in their own apps. They could build a, a, an actual network, like a bona fide network where, hey, I run an app and I'm going to plug in, or I probably won't even need to plug in an Apple SDK, right? Because if, if it's on iOS, it should have native access to those APIs. And so I could just invoke without having to install any sort of SDK. I could invoke the, the whatever product, whatever mechanism they're going to use to serve ads. Maybe it's some sort of mediation platform or something, or, or my mediation platform accepts you know, their demand and they're just filling my placements. I'm an app developer, an independent app developer. And like, without having to do too much plumbing, I can instantly start serving Apple's ads. That's, that's one opportunity. There's some question marks around that, but yeah, I think that's, that's a decent size opportunity. But I think, you know, the reality is if you look at the scale of the mobile app ad networks, they're, they're fairly small, right? All of them are fairly small in the 10, $15 billion range, right? If you want to take on something like Meta or something like YouTube, you've got to be much more expansive than that. And, and the question is like, will they expand beyond a just app install ads into sort of like any kind of ad? Could e-com advertisers advertise uh, across this network or even just in the app store? Will they include other of their properties? I think podcasts seems like a fair bet. I think Apple TV Plus, they've already sort of, you know, they've already, they haven't announced, but it's re- been reported that they've been courting advertisers to advertise in Apple TV Plus, sort of like Netflix does. So I, I think, you know, there's a number of different pathways they could take, but I could see that if it's just constrained to app, app install ads, it's not that big of a business. But if they've expand it to be like scale of like a YouTube across multiple different properties, and they have this like sort of walled garden component, but they can also potentially even deliver ads into third parties that aren't just app install, but like could do e and everything else and brand, then yeah, there, there's probably a pretty big opportunity there. And, and then kind of along those lines, I watched a, a video you did, I think it was at Iron Source, like a talk you did last year. And and then you were talking about how it, Shopify has their audience network. And it, when you said it, you could sort of see the crowd was like, what the hell is he talking about? It feels like yeah. something people don't really think about like as much as, as you would just given the scale. Do you have a point of view on like, if like, if you can run an audience network purely off of a payments platform, like let's call it Apple Pay, maybe even like a PayPal, 
Or like, do you also need to be sort of the retailer? Like, we, do you think there'll be like a bifurcation there? Or, you know, because just like the OPEX related to like being the retailer along with the payments platform may come with more detriments and benefits. I, I just don't know if you, if you thought through that at all yet. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think so Shopify is, is they don't, you know, own any retail shops, right? It's just the yeah. platform. And, you know, that audience network has achieved a pretty impressive amount of traction. But, you know, they've been expanding it to new platforms, they expanded it to Pinterest, and, and they sort of like overhauled it. And, and a lot of retailers are seeing, you know, impressive results now. And they don't own any retail shops, like, but they are, they're facilitating the transactions again, they're, they're, they're getting the payment uh, artifacts, because they process the transactions for the retailers. So they, they get sort of like a, a purview across the entirety of their retailer network. If you're just a standalone average retailer, I think it's it's probably harder to aggregate enough diversified data points to actually sell, right? So again, like Ulta Beauty, I mean, that's a very specific example. They do cosmetics, right? Well, if I'm a cosmetics advertiser, yeah, I want to average, I want to average, I want to target that audience, but that audience is not that big, you know. Even like a Nike or something, it's like okay, well, that's a much larger set of 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 you know sort of consumer profiles and. And, and uh, you know, it, it's more diversified still. But even then, like if I want to sell hammers or drills or sort of like home improvement equipment, I'm probably not going to them for their audience, right? So that's what made, you know, at and, and Meta's, you know, regained, you know, obviously they had a brilliant quarter last in Q2, but uh, yeah, they've regained some of their signal and they've done a lot of work on like the modeling side. But, you know, that's what made them so formidable kind of at peak was just that total scale, right? It was almost the total scale of the internet that they had. And, and that bank of data was just so vast is like no one could really compete with it. So all of these changes that we've talked about from regulation to kind of expanded ad platforms and ad services, um, kind of the audience extensions from kind of various retailers and whatnot, taking all that into consideration, do you think this is a, a net positive for advertisers in general or a net negative? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, it, it's it's hard for me to sort of like take a binary position on it. I think what you unlock, so what advertisers are having to adapt to is that the sort of uh, brute force guerrilla method of collecting a bunch uh, of a person's purchase history and then targeting against that is just not possible anymore, broadly, right? With with like a hub and spoke style platform. That's, that's what I, what, that's what I call the approach that, you know, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, Snap took, which is like, they're the hub, the spokes of their advertisers, their advertisers send them data back, they aggregate it, they, you know, they, they apply their machinery on that data set. And then they, they, they're able to target users pretty with, with relevant ads as a result, right? That's just not possible now. It never will be. And that's, that's going to be more performant for certain types of advertisers campaigns than anything else that will emerge. Right. But what is possible now when you trans transition your measurement systems away from this environment where you could tr you could follow an individual from the ad click onto a separate property into the purchase flow and into some sort of like you know total user journey observation path using this this distinct identifier right? Which is uh, the cookie or the, the device ID. When, when you move away from that sort of measurement technology uh, or approach, then all other formats of ads uh, become, become capable of being measured, right? So when your measurement apparatus can only ingest data where there is a singular user identifier that maps one-to-one -to, -one to a specific person and is constant over time, and allows you to sort of aggregate an entirety of a behavioral history to that person. Well, that's very, very precise for that type of inventory, right? But it precludes measurement for all other types of inventory, right? Now, when you go to a more probabilistic approach, which is like, I have no idea who made that purchase, right? But I have a methodology for trying to do that attribution and trying to measure the effectiveness, measure, measure the causal impact on this dollar of ad spend using sort of a probabilistic model, well, then I can go deploy money on billboards. I can deploy money on podcast ads. I can deploy money on influencer ads. I, I've just had this whole universe of inventory be opened up to me. Now, will my measurement be precise? No, of course not. But can it be, will it be accurate to the individual? No, that's impossible because you don't know who these people are. They're anonymous. But can it be instructive in allowing me to deploy my ad spend efficiently? Yes, it can. Now that's hard to do and it takes a lot of work, 
But if you can get there, right, well, then the world is your billboard. You can deploy money on any type of ad form. It doesn't have to be just, you know, social media direct response. And so there's a lot of opportunity being unlocked with these adaptations that advertisers are, are making. And I think it's really exciting. Now, it's also scary. And there's a lot of reasons that it's scary. First of all, if you're a business and you've been running, you know, a scaled, you know, user acquisition function or a scaled direct response advertising function for years and years and years, and you've built up a whole system for operating in, in with, with perceived or, or perceived or actual precision around performance, making that transition is very difficult. And it's very scary. It's very intimidating, right? And it's also just what the outputs are different, right? The outputs are not, hey, you spent $100 on this campaign yesterday and you got back 110 today. And then tomorrow it'll be 120. And the next day it'll be 127. Like you can't know that, right? And that's, very, that's a very scary adaptation to make. And it requires like a sort of like a lot of intellectual flexibility. And that's where I'm seeing a lot of companies get hung up right now is because yeah. they, they're too scared to make the jump. Yeah, it's funny, obviously, and, and, and you can't like feel bad for the platforms, but I can say for from our time at Snap and then our friends that are still there, like it's scary regardless if you're a multi-billion dollar market cap business or, or even like a small D2C brand, just the the sort of intellectual sort of rigor and the just total sort of mind shift of like how things work. Like it really isn't going back and it's, it's, it, it's funny. We actually saw an example of this yesterday, just even, and again, and we're, we're not at snap anymore, obviously. So, you know, all this stuff's public, but for years when we were there, we were like begging them to put basically like an action button on the discover feed. So like, instead you had to click the, you know, it used to be you had to click the, the tile and then you had to swipe up and we're like, can we just mm-hmm. put a button that says like install or like sign up yeah. or something here. And forever it was no. And then yesterday it showed up and a bunch of us were like, Okay, good. Like at least intellectually, they know things aren't the way they used to be anymore, and that yeah, you're yeah. gonna have to make a, a couple of different choices there. Your, well, your legacy, your legacy is manifest. I, <laughs> there you go. We were, there was a a chat thread of us that were 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 excited to see it at least. I guess given all that stuff, like just you know, what is it like an ad tech and martech right now that like that you could point to maybe to being the most exciting, just to something that like that people aren't thinking about that really could be pretty interesting over the next few years. Well, it's actually becoming like a, a call it a, a technological frontier, which is exciting because for a long time, you know, MarTech slash ad tech, and I'm not an ad tech guy. I'm a, a, I have a history as an operator, as, as a performance marketer. I've built ad tech for like internal use at companies I've worked at, but I've never worked at a Facebook or Snap or like whatever, a, a Magnite or a Trade Desk or anything like that, right? But for a very long time, like ad tech was essentially just like, glorified relational databases. It was like, hey, we've got this data set over here and then we've got that data set over there. And like the our commercial potential is unlocked by joining those two data sets. Like to, to the to the degree that it's 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 represented by the degree to which we can join those two data sets. Right. And again, I call it like brute force guerrilla, you know, targeting. Right. It's like, well we know this, we know this stuff about this person and therefore, and, you know, we can layer in a bunch of like more sophisticated like machine learning you know, type just valuation techniques for like an individual and like relevancy scores and stuff like that. But for the most part, it's like whoever can collect the most data and and join these disparate data sets is going to have the best ad tech product. And now it's actually, you know, emerging as like a frontier in technological innovation, right? Not just in, you know, collecting, you know, signal in, in call it novel ways like CAPI is. Mm. And I didn't answer your question about CAPI, but I'll, I'll come back to it. But, but also in terms of just like, you know, statistic, statistical techniques for measuring impact, right? And that's, that's really exciting to my mind. And there's a bunch of initiatives that are happening, you know, that, that are sort of like supporting the advertising use case, like multi-party compute, uh, homomorphic encryption, like all this stuff is being applied to different like advertising use cases to, to say, look, you know, we, we've, we've either uh, are collecting the same data, but we're applying uh, so much obfuscation to it that no one could ever decipher it. And only in matching is it useful, but not in not as like the atomic unit of data itself. Or we're we're not collecting the data, but we're making a whole bunch of assumptions using like novel statistical techniques to determine you know where the to determine the, the genesis of this conversion. Right now, Cappy it almost is like a Schrodinger's data or something like that. You know, we don't know we don't know how it's being used. Right. So the question to my mind when someone talks because Cappy is not a Facebook thing; it's an every everybody thing. Yeah. TikTok has a Cappy, Snap has a Cappy, Pinterest has a Cappy. You know, Google has a Cappy, and, and Facebook has probably the OG Cappy, right? 
So the question is, how much data are you actually capturing with the Capy post back? And how much, uh, how, how weighted on the IP address is that data? And if it's very heavily weighted towards IP address in terms of making the match, well, then that's not future proof, right? If there's just a purely like a, a sort of time-based model, then yeah, that, that probably is future proof. It's totally anonymous post back, but for the advertisers or the publisher's ID, right? Well, the advertiser's ID and the product ID, and you can match that with like just kind of clickstream data for, you know, your platforms for, for the ads that your platforms are. Yeah, then that could be future proof. The question is, we don't know that. Now, I think on the IP address front, we've got a couple of years before that truly gets obfuscated by Apple. But if it does, and when it, I think when it does, well, then yeah, the, the cappies that are, you know, very heavily reliant on IP address for doing matching, they're going to break. But if the cappy is really just a method of like, just bring me a bunch of anonymized signal and I've got a bunch of anonymized clickstream data and I can match those two things using statistical techniques. And yes, that is future proof. And that's really interesting. And so that, that's actually a, a good segue to I think this next question. But as we start to kind of close out this conversation, we like to kind of end it with a series of, of questions, you know, to get your kind of quick take on them. And I think the first is really relevant to what you just said, but you know, you, you spent some time kind of in your career building out an open source library for marketing cohort analysis. You made that uh, open source, publicly available. And why did you think that it was important to make it open source? Well, why I did it was I had a lot of free time in my hands. <laughs> and I had, I had sort of built it just for personal use. And I thought it would be a fulfilling accomplishment to kind of polish it and release it. And it's done really well. I think it's, it's, it's pretty close in terms of GitHub stars to the Google lightweight pro framework product, whatever. So I'm, I'm really, that's, I'm really proud of that. I actually just did an overhaul to it and public, pushed it two weeks ago or something. And so I plan to actually pick up, I'm going on paternity leave soon. So I plan to use some of that time to add some new features to it. But yeah, why, why, why did I think it was valuable? Because I, I think it was just something that it was, it was sort of like a perspective on cohorts that a lot of marketers didn't take, right? Like everyone was very, this is like the 2000, 19 era. So pre ATT, everyone was just very much focused on like, let me count individual acquisition cost and compare that to individual revenue. And I thought that there's a lot of value in actually aggregating individuals into cohorts and tracking cohorts over time and using that to project out the health of the product. Right. And I think it's probably even more critically vital now to do that post ATT. But yeah, the reason I did it was just, I had a lot of free time on my hands and I thought it would be like a fulfilling project. Like I also wrote a book and let me tell you, books are not very lucrative. Unless you write like a New York Times bestseller, your book will not make much money. But nonetheless, I'm very happy that I did it. I published that into, you know, I haven't made that much money with it, but I'm still very proud of having done that. You know, that would be like a thing that goes on my tombstone. Well, this probably will too. And then we were going to ask you actually, if we thought Apple was the good or bad guy and all this, but we kind of answered that. So instead, this is a question I ask all the time on Twitter and we have you here. So maybe you can give us your point of view is why is the trade desk worth so much in comparison to the social networks that own inventory? Is there like, can you give us kind of an insight into like how the, the miracle of the trade desk sort of is? Yeah, that's a great, uh, great question. I think it's because of their magazine. Uh, you know, they publish, they publish a magazine and I think that, that, that impacts their, their multiple. No, I, I, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, I think it's just fast growing, you know, it's obviously on a much smaller revenue scale than, you know, the, the largest social networks. So yeah, it's just fast growing on a smaller base. You know, they're doing some really exciting stuff with CTV. And I think that's a big opportunity. And I think that scene is probably like the big growth vector in, in, in digital advertising. And so, you know, they've been really early there and they've had a lot of success with that. And so that could be one reason. You know, the other reason it's, it's kind of like the enablement platform for a lot of these retail media networks. Like a lot of these retail media networks, you might think of an RMN as like, hey, I have an app and I'm going to build an ad system to show ads in my app. But a lot of retail media networks don't go that far. They just take their audience data and push it on a trade desk and say, hey, you can target my audience on trade desk. And so they are sort of like the enablement platform for, you know, this very sort of like real, you know, growth trajectory of RMN, of everything as an ad network. And so that's probably another reason. But yeah, their they're multiple is pretty large. And, and do you think that is the audience sort of extension a use case like that? Do you think that has some like future proof risks as well, just in terms of... Uh regulatory environment? Well, I mean, not even regulatory environment, just platform pi uh, platform policy environment, right? So like cookies going away is going to be disruptive to that, right? 
and I'm not call me a skeptic about universal ID cookie replacement type identifiers. I'm I'm fairly skeptical of that as a solution, as a durable solution. So yeah, there's there's risks. And there's been a shift towards kind of non-ad derived revenue for these traditionally ad supported platforms. So Facebook's verification, obviously Twitter's verification, Snap, you know, Snapchat yeah. Plus, Apple, I think just announced that they surpassed a billion users in their subscription services. Yep. What's your take on 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 that? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, my sense is it probably just doesn't work, but you may not have a choice, right? So like, this is the point of this article that I'm publishing tomorrow. It's like, well, how are these companies going to make money in Europe? Like if they essentially can't do behavioral ads. So one thing to remember is like, when LAT was introduced, LAT is limit ad tracking. It was a setting in iOS where you could basically revoke your IDFA to all apps, right? It was, it was a precursor to ATT. It was 20, I want to say 2016, it was introduced. You know, the LAT rate kind of just crept up incrementally year over year until basically by the time ATT was introduced, it was almost 50% is what I've been told in the United States, in the United States, which, which had one of the highest rates worldwide, right? When, but when, a, when LAT was introduced and you started seeing these devices that didn't have an identifier available, Facebook stopped showing ads to them in the mobile newsfeed, right? Why? Because if we can't personalize the ad to you, it's going to churn you. Yeah. If we're just showing you a bunch of random ads, it's going to degrade the product experience to such an extent that you might churn out. It's not worth the risk, right? So the question is like, well, if we can't do personalized ads, what ads can we do? Because we know that showing you just random ads will probably churn you out. Well, they know that. Twitter doesn't know that by my observation. But so the question is like, if you can't do personalized ads, is ads foreclosed, right? Like is the ad driven business model foreclosed? And if it is, what choice do you have? Right now, if there, if there is an option, then you'd probably prefer that because what you want to do is sort of like maximize engagement with this sort of like ambient monetization mechanic. The more, the more heavy handed you are with monetization, the higher churn goes up and the worse the product experience is because of irrelevant content, the, the higher churn goes. And so, I mean, it, 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 that's the question is like, is it completely foreclosed or is it just, do we have to jump through a bunch of hoops? And if we have to jump through a bunch of hoops, it's probably worth the pain. And if it's completely foreclosed, then, then ads as a monetization option probably aren't viable. Okay. We kind of close out. Obviously, you do a ton of great work on kind of mobile dev memo, in Quantmar, on Twitter, kind of all of your, your newsletter, everything you're putting out on technology. But do you have a second favorite sector that you either are personally really passionate about or if it wasn't, you know, advertising and tech that you'd be, you think you'd be researching? Yeah, I'm like a big macro head. So, I mean, I, you know, that's, I mean, I don't read that. I, I would say I don't read that much about digital advertising. Like when I wake up in the morning and I'm going through my Feedly, it's all just macro stuff. So I think if I didn't, whatever, if, if you know, I had uh, gone left instead of right 10 years ago, I, I don't know, who knows what I'd be doing. Maybe I'd be working at like a macro-based hedge fund or something. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's I think 80% of the reading I do is just econ-based, you know, macro-based and, and, and understanding how, what I love about macro is it's just like, you know, you really are overwhelmed with data points and trying to resolve them all into like a coherent view of the world or a coherent view of what's driving markets. It, it's just really exciting because it's, 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 it's in, in intensely challenging. Fantastic. And so anyone listening, kind of where can they find you and follow some of the things you're putting out? I spend way too much time on Twitter, so that's probably the best place to go. And, you know, secondarily to that, mobiledevmemo.com is, is my website. Great. We'll put all of that in the, in the show notes, make sure people have access to all that. But Eric, this was phenomenal. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, cheers, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, man. Before you go, we need your help. If you enjoyed this week's episode of Taking Inventory, then subscribe or rate wherever you listen to the podcast. And while you're at it, please share this episode or your favorite episode with a friend. We'll be back next week with another episode of Taking Inventory. 